here with us from the, the uh, smoggy and swampy and Floridian Abu Dhabi. <laughs> <laughs> we have Dave, Dave Des Myers, who's going to give a talk on how long of quantum dates in Hotel -ho Camp Theory. We're very glad to have him, have him so welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, it's a wonderful like, experience to be back out here after a couple years. Um, it's, it's really nice to see you all and all these new faces as well. So uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about topological quantum gates and homotopy type theory. Quite a few of you saw this talk at ACT two days ago or three days ago. Um, this is the slightly extended version. However, uh, some of you did not see it uh, three days ago, so I'm going to do it uh, over again anyway. Um, so, uh, right, so this is part of a uh, sort of broad program uh, initiated by Hisham Sati and Urs Schreiber, who are my uh, collaborators on this paper, um, to uh, get really at the foundations of topological quantum computing um, using uh, techniques that they developed uh, in, in their studies in string theory, basically using cohomology or really more specifically twisted equivariant differential cohomology theories to govern uh, uh, the fields in, that arise in, in string theory, but then it also, as it turns out, in these anionic models of topological quantum uh, computing. So we're not gonna need any of those specifics today, so if that was a little scary, don't worry. We're not gonna do that. Um, instead, I'm gonna go through a, a sort of an introduction to um, all of these ideas, and this is sort of the order that the, uh, the talk will take. Um, so first we're going to talk about what logic gates are, then we're going to talk about what quantum mechanics is, we're going to have a brief little overview of what it means to be topological, uh, and then we're, I'm going to introduce some type theory very briefly. We're going to talk about what makes a homotopy type theory a homotopy type theory, and finally we're going to see how to do topological quantum gates in homotopy type theory. So I, this joke doesn't land twice the people who saw it, but I could have really called the talk Gates Quantum Topological Type Theory Homotopy In. <laughs> All right, so, uh, uh, right. so here's uh, uh, some abstract models of computation. On the left is classical, and on the right is quantum. So in uh, classical, quantum, uh, cl classical computation, we take a two-state system, and we represent those two states as zero and one, and that's our bit. This is the most simple kind of uh, system that you can compute with. Um, and a logic gate we understand is intending to be a uh, function that takes some bits and turns them into some other bits. So uh, for me, all logic gates will be reversible because uh, that's just all, all of quantum mechanics is reversible. So that's just how we do it. So in particular, we have our two, bait, uh, two state system, zero, one. C naught is a reversible gate. It goes from takes two bits and produces two bits, and you can see its behavior described below, describing uh, where the two bits get, get mapped to. So the way this gate explicitly works is that if the first wire carries a zero, then the second one acts as the identity, and if the first wire carries a one, the second one acts as not. That's controlled not. Um, quantum systems, uh, their basic model is sort of the same, but complex linear, aka quantum. So uh, now we have a simple quantum system, which is a two, uh, a, ba uh, a, a Hilbert space with two basis elements, which we write as zero and one, just like in the classical system. And now what we have in, instead of a, a logic gate or a, you know, in classical computing, we have something we call a quantum gate. Um, and this is something that implements the, uh, uh, a, a basic element of an operation. I should say maybe that like when you put these, you end up putting these together into logic circuits and we can do the same with quantum gates. We can put them together into quantum circuits. And here, uh, C naught is the same sort of thing, but here it takes a uh, two quantum bits and produces two quantum bits, but now we combine them not with the Cartesian product, but with the linear, complex linear tensor product. So here, uh, this is, takes four, a four-dimensional complex vector space into another four-dimensional complex vector space. Such a linear map is determined by a matrix, a four-by-four four matrix, which you can see there. And if you look there, you can see that it's written in the same way as the basis elements of, of here. So if we apply the basis elements to this, to that, it behaves exactly the same. 
but now we can have some mixed states as well. So those would be pure states, but we can have some mixed states as well, which are in superposition, as they're called, or complex linear conjugate, a com combination of the two basis elements, and those uh, apply in a slightly different way. Um, right. But uh, as, so as we're going through here in, in our design of these systems, we have a sort, certain kind of a, a layers of abstraction. And uh, we start with this idea of these, these sort of diagrams, and they represent these abstract functions. And those abstract functions are going to be our intention for the system. So uh, you know, we want C0 to behave like this function. It just takes in some values, and it produces some other values at the end. And similarly, in, um, in quantum mechanics, we want to produce a unitary function uh, or a, uh, a norm-preserving uh, complex linear um, function on the state spaces. But as we are trying to actually implement these things into hardware, so that's some physical system that actually performs this computation for us, right? We need usually some intermediate representations. And these intermediate representations, I, I'm calling them here operational semantics, it's not necessarily, these don't, terms don't quite map on exactly as how they're used in computing, but um, over here, an example is we might represent our, uh, instead of our logic circuit, which is just the logical behavior, we might have an intermediate representation as an electrical circuit, which represents a physical system, which will implement the computation, the abstract computation of the logic circuit. And so uh, as you can see that it has semantics here uh, in, um, in ordinary differential equations, um, and then when we put them together, those are like closer to the metal. Those are more describing the actual physical situation of the implemented circuit. Um, similarly, on the uh, quantum mechanical side, we would actually take something, even though we have these finite dimensional, nice and understandable uh, functions describing the, the intended semantics of our quantum circuits, usually these would actually be implemented by slightly more complex systems, which could be represented by more complex and more like you know, close to the expected physical system models of quantum mechanics. So I'm just going to focus on Schrodinger's equation, the sort of simplest case here, and we'll, we'll work our way up to more realistic models of topological quantum computation as we go on. Um, one thing I, I think is fun here is that these, the actual result uh, is sort of a reification of these wiring diagrams in a, set, in a way. They actually, the machines themselves actually end up looking like wiring diagrams. So you have this mixture of the figurative and the literal, which is really fun in category theory. Oh, and another thing I'll say is that in this talk, I'm not going to really do too much of the actual like applied category stuff we usually do where we talk about compositionality of systems and putting them together using wiring diagrams. This is going to be focusing on a small class of systems and how to formalize them in type theory. Um, and uh, I want to leave it open for conversation how we can use these, this, this sort of point of view on systems that I'm going to describe shortly. And, uh, and how we could add compositionality to these things so that we could understand building up more complex circuits out of simple ones. Um, but I, I'm not going to cover that in this talk. All right. So here's a crash course on what quantum mechanics is, my point of view. Um, so quantum mechanics, we start with a Hilbert space of states. A Hilbert space is a complex vector space with an inner product. Um, maybe there's some topology involved. I'll just you know, brush over all of that. So we have a Hilbert space of states, and then we have this Hamiltonian operator, which is an operator on the Hilbert space, a linear transformation that preserves the inner product. Um, and the dynamics is given by, oh, sorry, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean this one doesn't. But uh, the dynamics is given by Schrodinger's equation, which is, I've written up here. It's a, 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 it's a linear um, a differential equation involving the Hamiltonian, and we can solve that because it's linear in a really nice way to a one parameter family of operators. In this case, these ones are unitary operators. Um, uh, UT, given like that. And so this is the idea that this is the evolution of our system. If our system starts at time t, then in state phi, then uh, we go, we run it into time, sorry, if it starts at time zero in state phi, and we run it to time t naught, um, then u of t naught of phi is the resulting state our system ends up in, right? And, uh, uh, and if, th if, this, uh, if we have some gate, which we understand to be some kind of abstract unitary just floating around that describes how we wanted our system to behave, and we applied it to phi and we got that answer, then we would say that this system implements this. So we, in other words, we started with something a little bit one step behind where we wanted to end up with, with our specification. Namely, we started with our Hamiltonian. We solved it 
into this, uh, this uh, uh, operator that we then say works like the gates intended to. But there's something that's uh, weird about this, which if you uh, like type theory, you can, might notice, because this almost uh, is, is uh, I've, I've told you what most of the things here are, but I never told you what T was. So what is T? T was not given a type on this page. So let's, let's take a minute to understand how can we, what, what type of thing is T? T is a real parameter. It's a free real parameter, so it lives in the real line. So what we really have going on here is a bundle of Hilbert spaces over the real line. We have a Hilbert space for every uh, time parameter t. Now any such bundle like this is trivializable because uh, it's, r is contractible. Um, so the, the, the data you need to get one of these going is essentially the same as the data we had before, which is to say just a Hilbert space, right? But thinking about it this way, we now have states at time zero and states at time t. And the transformation will take states at time zero to states at time t like that. So um, now uh, this bundle is trivializable. So a connection is actually just given by a one form valued in endomorphisms of the fiber. And uh, uh, what that is, is uh, a real valued function valued in endomorphisms of the fiber here, where we have the Hamiltonian, um, appears as this connection one form. So the data of the Hamiltonian gets reinterpreted as the data of a connection on this Hilbert bundle. So I'm just going through the data on the previous slide, but again, we're, we're thinking of it now where we understand what that T is. It's a classical parameter that's external to the rest of the system. And now really coolly, solving Schrodinger's equation gives us parallel transport uh, using this connection. So to solve, to get parallel uh, transport involves solving a differential equation. Turns out that's Schrodinger's equation in this example. And so what we can do is if we have a path in the parameter space R, which is say just, I mean, R is itself just a path. So it's just like going from zero to T like that. Then we can solve um, for the parallel transport and we get to move states in the fiber over zero to states in the fiber over T. And we do that uh, using the operator that solves the Schrodinger equation. So parallel transport now over paths is the dynamics of our system. Okay, so in general, this is what uh, we're gonna end up with. Time isn't the only classical parameter our systems might depend on. We might have other classical parameters around. And so in general, a quantum system for us is gonna be a Hilbert bundle with a connection. And the connection plays the role of the Hamiltonian that is then parallel transport gives us the actual dynamics of the system. So the idea I like to, think about here is that, the, that we have a bunch of science knobs going on in our science experiment, and they, all the different positions the knobs can be in is uh, expressed in a certain space P. And as we turn those knobs, we trace out a path in P. And as we turn those knobs, our system also gets messed up, and it, it's, it, it's, its state evolves. And that brings it to a new state, and that new state is not in the same, it, it's sort of it is not a state for the system at, uh, with parameters P0, it's actually a state for the system with parameters P1. Um, in general, because parallel transport gives you an isomorphism, these are isomorphic, but it matters how you do this. So one of the things that makes quantum computing really hard is that uh, quantum uh, mechanical sy systems are highly susceptible to noise. And one of the ways to understand that from this point of view is that whenever you want to take care of a, a quantum system with so many qubits, right? You need to actually have a big apparatus that can handle maintaining the, those qubits. And that big apparatus has lots of ways that it can change, lots of parameters that describe its behavior. So you have this sort of curse of dimensionality where you have a lot of parameters. And now, as you turn your science knobs, you actually introduce a lot of noise into the system. And so, for example here, you have, uh, say, as you, as you wanna do this path that goes from P0 to P1, but the actual path you do is this other little noisy path that's like around it. Now, if, if you, if uh, in general, parallel transport over a connection is highly dependent on the actual path you take. So you can end up with even small perturbations of your original path, you can end up with arbitrary differences in the resulting change of state, which is difficult. So there are many ways to solve this problem. The most common one now, I'm forgetting the acronym, but the most common one now is basically to stop your quantum system every few, you know, however small time step you, you use 
and do a classical error, uh, error correction method on it, then restart your quantum system. This obviously has problems with scaling, not the least because you need like a lot of ordinary classical bits for every quantum bit. Um, it also has problems with speed because you're, you're effectively injecting like a whole sort of extra bunch of steps in between every one of your algorithm, uh, in between every step of your algorithm. So yeah, Owen, sorry. Did you think of a, a bundle with a connection as kind of an analogous to a delta limb, a continuous version of a delta limb? Yes, I think that's, I think that's a reasonable way to think of it for sure because uh, you have paths up in the total space and you have paths in the base and continuous functions map paths to paths, but then you also have this lifting condition. So it's very much a delta lens. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, I think you could say that it is exactly a delta lens on the path manifold. In fact, uh, one thing I would say is that a bundle with connection is equivalent to a functor on the path groupoid where your quotient passed by so-called thin homotopy, landing in the groupoid of Hilbert spaces. So um, there's a nice functorial expression of this idea, which I would love to chat about because it has to do with how we can uh, make this compositional and talk about bringing the leaves together. Okay, so what, there's another point of view here, which is that, um, boy, wouldn't it be great if, if it just didn't matter um, whether you injected any noise or not? Like, wouldn't that make this problem much easier? And so if the connection is flat, then the uh, parallel transport is homotopy invariant in the path, which means that if you have a continuous deformation of one path into the another, you have an equality on the results of the parallel transport. And since we expect the noise to be roughly small and in our parameter space and not to go around any big loops that might be there. As you can see, I have a little donut hole here. We imagine that the noise is small enough that I'm not gonna knock myself all the way to the other side of the donut hole. And for that reason, I will have a homotopy, which is drawn in red here. I will zoom in, boom. I'll have a homotopy drawn in red here, which, goes, uh, which brings my noisy path back to my intended path. And therefore, if I had a flat connection, then the system would be, uh, then the system would be um, insulated from this kind of noise, as they call it. So this is what physicists call topological insulation. So roughly speaking, these definitions are all roughly speaking. Um, the, a, a quantum system is topologically insulated if the connection is flat, and therefore parallel transport is homotopy invariant. And in this case, in this case, um, it, such a bundle, if as I said, same to Owen, oh, a bundle with connection is a similar to a, is the same thing as a functor on the path groupoid up the thin homotopy, which is effectively it's a little more complicated than this, but effectively you can re you can change how fast you go along your paths, but you can't like change where the path goes. But you actually can descend to the actual fundamental groupoid, which is where you quotient out by all homotopies, which sweep out actual areas as you go between your paths, and you get a, a functor of groupoids from the fundamental groupoid. In this case, it's, I've, I've written it here as the one object groupoid whose morphisms are the elements of the fundamental group of your base space, of your parameter space, and they land in the groupoid of Hilbert spaces. So you end up with a representation of a group. So you, end, you have a, a great collapsing of information down from something um, geometric and complex algebraic, or complex analytic, I should say, to something uh, <laughs> complex algebraic, some representation theory of a group. Um, so uh, this is the point of view of topological quantum computing, um, the idea being that th to have really scalable uh, quantum computing systems with lots of qubits, you're going to have to avoid this problem of noise, and the best way to do it is just make sure that they're completely insulated from noise mathematically in the first place. There's a trade-off, the trade-off being it's really hard to build these systems, <laughs> of course. No one's done it yet, but okay, yeah. So what does it mean for a connection to be flat? Uh, uh, great, thanks. Um, it, one of the ways to say is that there's a quantity you can call the curvature, which you can understand as sort of, if you take parallel transports along loops, that's called holonomy. And if you take the limit as the loops get really small, you end up with a single quantity, which is called the curvature at a point. And if that is zero, then the connection is said to be flat. Another definition, which is much more related to this, or uh, is that it's flat precisely when it's, uh, it's parallel transport is invariant under homotopy. Uh, uh, because um, if you're on a manifold, any sufficiently small loop is null homotopic. Um, because any, any sufficiently small patch is 
the same thing as Rn. There is isomorphic to Rn. And so Rn is contractible. So you can contract any sufficiently small loop. In other words, like no matter where, how many weird bubbles and burps and holes you have in your manifold, if you're really close to a point, it looks flat. Um, okay. um, so what, what could like a quantum topological, a topological quantum system look like? Oh, I will say, before we go on, topological quantum gate is a gate, quantum gate, that is implemented by a topological quantum system. Yeah. So um, what could they look like? Uh, one of the more realistic proposals which people are shooting for is to uh, look at breeding anionic defects in, defects in topological quantum materials. So uh, the idea is that you take something which is roughly a two-dimensional crystal lattice, or maybe it's a virtual lattice, like it's a lattice in some other space like momentum space people sometimes do, but let's just pretend it's physical. So you take a roughly two-dimensional lattice, something like graphene, right? Um, and then uh, lattices and crystal lattices can have uh, problems in their making that are called defects. And here's a picture of some plastic balls arranged in a grid, and they exhibit uh, two kinds of defects here, which are zero and one-dimensional defects. So a zero-dimensional defect is something that looks like it could fit another ball in it, so it's like a point. And here you can see that sometimes they get into arrangement where there's like a hole, right? Um, and uh, those are point defects. Uh, I can say that formally a, a crystal is something which has a, is, has a sort of symmetry. It's highly symmetric, a discrete symmetry group at the crystal node points. Um, and a defect is something which has a different symmetry group. So the symmetry group of one of these points is you can see is a sort of double triangle here. It's highly symmetric, excuse me. But here, this one is non-symmetric. It looks different on that side than on that side. So it's symmetry broken. So that's how you know there's a defect there. Um, and, uh, and this other thing is a line defect. It's a slippage. I don't know if you can see that. We're going to not can talk about line defects. We're going to assume our crystals don't have line defects. So the idea is that you would build one of these materials. Oh, so on one of these materials, you have a lot of these excitations. You have some kind of particle field. And these are called, uh, oh, excuse me. I got ahead of myself. What do I mean when I talk about braiding defects? Uh, first of all, I want you to note that if you squish one of these things, you can imagine moving those holes. So if I press down on this on the top, maybe you can see that these would get pressed and they would like pop out there. But then by virtue of the way I'm pressing, it would also cause another things to separate out and the hole would end up looking like it's moving down. Um, and so you can see this I, I, uh, the demonstration. If you if you ever see a bunch of oranges stacked up in the grocery store, um, and then they ever have a defect, which means they're not they're not stacked like this. They're stacked like where they're multiple. You push them down, you'll find that either something falls or something moves away. That other movement is the defect moving. That's the way to think about it. So they move like particles. This is one of the things that's interesting. They move like objects through here. Um, so uh, we also have in, in between the defects or on this, on this crystal, we have some excitations of some field. And these are little particles we can think about and they're allowed to flit around, but they can't go into the defects because they, they live in, in the lattice. And so uh, these are called anionic particle excitations. Um, I'll just say briefly what the word anion means because I didn't say it at ACT, but I have a little more time now. Um, in, uh, in four dimensions or three plus one dimensions, of space-time, uh, you can have two kinds of so-called spin statistics. Um, these are or exchange statistics, as I should say. Um, and what happens is if you have a system with two particles, right, then there's two options what happens if you switch them. Either your system, your state picks up a sign change or it doesn't. If it doesn't, they're called bosons, and if it does, they're called fermions. And this is the thing feature that underlies the Pauli exclusion principle which, uh, uh, which um, uh, says that effectively if you can't have two fermions in the same state, and the reason is because if they were in the same state, you could swap them, your state would pick up a negative sign, but it's still the same state because they were in the same state and you swap them. You have like, you know, A comma A swap gets A comma A, right? It's the same kind of thing. And therefore, the state must equal its own negative, which means it must be zero, which means it can't happen. That's the Pauli exclusion principle in that way. When you're in two dimensions, on the other hand, 
um, you uh, actually have many more possibilities that you can have for uh, what happens when you exchange two things, because it's actually gonna now depend on how you exchange them. The reason is effectively because in four dimensions you can untie any knots, but in two plus one dimensions, or in, the, in three dimensions, which is what this system is, it's two dimensional and then time, you actually can, in other words, tie knots in, in space time. And these, uh, these turns out that for this, <laughs> for this reason it matters which, uh, like how you exchange things in a much more important way. So like you can pick up any unitary transformation as a result of exchanging th particles. And that's why they're called anions, because they can do anything. Um, so maybe that was too much of a detour. Um, anyway, the point here uh, is that we have a pretty reasonable uh, uh, theory for what we expect the physics of one of these topological quantum materials to be like. And it is expected to be a certain kind of conformal field theory, and the states are affected to, uh, expected to be um, uh, something called the uh, 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 conformal blocks which are certain kinds of uh, terms that appear when you do this conformal field theory, and they form a Hilbert space living over the configuration space, uh, the, the uh, sorry, I started this in a, start this in a really better way. What is our, what are our classical parameters here? It's gonna be where the defects points are. So we have a plane which represents our crystal, and then we point to where the defects are, and they're points on the plane. So our, config, our, our classical parameter space is gonna be the configuration point, play, space of D points on the plane. So we pick D points on the plane, they're distinct, and wherever we put them, that's our parameter. For every one of those parameters, we have the states of the possible system, which are sort of how all these particles can be flitting around. And they form the conformal blocks, and then the, the dynamics of this system is determined by something called the Konishnik Sumologikov equations, which give a connection on this bundle of conformal blocks. Um, so uh, one thing I want to point out here is that uh, what is a path in parameter space? So a point in parameter space here is a bunch of points on the plane where our holes are in our lattice, our defects are in our lattice. And then a path moves those points around, right? But they're never allowed to touch. So if you draw out the movie, they trace out a braid. So a braid, if you've heard of the braid group, a braid is a path in configuration space. And so now our dynamics is driven by braiding the defects. And that's what you can see going on here. So there's a very hard theorem, and uh, uh, it's sort of it's done by uh, quite a few people. Um, are, yes. Are, are the points labeled? Or are they, labeled? they are labeled, and these are the, it's the pure braids. That's right. Um, so uh, they're, they're, they're labeled, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we imagine that we can identify which defects are which. Yeah. And they always come back to the same spot, right? Yes, yes, um, yeah. Um, right, so this, uh, uh, there's a, a very difficult uh, theorem which is put in its most abstract and sort of, I think, crisp and complete form by uh, uh, Hisham and Erz in their paper, Anionic Defects in TEDK Theory. Um, which is called the hypergeometric integral construction, and it it's, it's effectively comes down, yeah, and it effectively comes down to this equivalence between two bundles. One, which is the one on the left, and the other, which on the right, is a bundle of twisted cohomology groups over the configuration space um, equipped with its Gaussmannian connection. And um, uh, uh, so one thing I want to note is just to read this, twisted cohomology I won't explain, but it's, it's cohomology in a certain kind of slice category is one way to say what it is. Um, but the actual spaces we're taking the cohomology of are the configuration spaces of the anionic particles. So if you have a configuration space of defects and you ask where can my particles be, well they can be anywhere but the points where the defects are. So that's a configuration of n particles in uh, R2 minus C, where C is a configuration of D points. Um, and so we, we get these cohomology groups, they're valued in the complex numbers, so they themselves are complex vector spaces, and that's where we get our complex, complex stuff. Um, so uh, uh, this, this thing on the, uh, on the left, is built out of analysis, geometry, conformal field theory. It's a lot of differential geometry. It's a lot of complex analysis. It's, it's very difficult stuff to work with. The thing on the right, despite the fact that it looks more complicated because I actually wrote the definition, um, <laughs> it's actually a lot simpler to deal with. It is something in pure homotopy theory. The Gaussmannian connection is something that is actually purely homotopic. Um, 
it is, it is expressed, as you can see, with just homological algebra and representation theory. In fact, it's like a purely representation theoretical algebraic object. So the thing on the, on the left is apparently very analytic, has a lot of topology in the mathematician sense. I should say that uh, when physicists say topology, they mean what mathematicians say, homotopy. So um, on the right, on the other hand, we have something discrete. Um, homotopy theory is a discrete qualitative study of the continuous situations in mathematics. So uh, if, you, if you know a little bit about it, you know one of the first things we do is we represent things by like simplicial sets, which are discrete combinatorial objects. So there's no, there's no space left over on the right-hand side. It's just pure algebra and, and connectivity, which is pretty cool. Okay, so because the Gauss-Menin connection is purely homotopical, we can use a purely homotopical theory to define it. Um, and this is the role that homotopy type theory will play here. So we're going to give an abstract formal verification of, uh, of these realistic uh, proposals for topological quantum computation using homotopy type theory. And indeed, it will, we'll do this in a way that, in principle at least, the code we give that verifies it could be run because it's going to be a programming language. And that will correspond to a classical simulation of the quantum protocol. Um, I will say that... Uh, that those might be slow, but there's a lot of really great work that's being done into making cubical Agda, as we'll see, or cubical homotopy type theory compute faster. And it's like, there's a lot of really great things that would come out uh, in, in uh, synthetic homotopy theory, the computation of the you know, homotopy groups of spheres, and this uh, uh, like simulating topological quantum gates if, if we could have this, this uh, programming language compute faster. Yes, it is. All right, so let me talk a little bit about homotopy type theory. So we're going to do homotopy type theory because it's the abstract language. It's a formal uh, logic for working directly with homotopy types. So a homotopy type is a topological space, but only considered up to homotopy or up to continuous deformation. So to say that we're working actually with the homotopy types themselves is a little weird because they're sort of these quotient objects in ordinary math. They're like a thing considered up to something. But for us, we're going to just re, we're going to just start the foundations of mathematics all over, and things are going to say what they mean, and also it's going to have the semantics into homotopy theory. So I'm just going to take that point of view. It's a little easier to understand. So it's a standalone foundation of mathematics as well. It's also a programming language. I didn't put that on this slide, but I probably should have. And I'm also not doing a code demo, but I probably should have. <laughs> so um, we have types of mathematical objects. So these are things like natural numbers, real numbers, complex numbers, but also structures like vector spaces, um, you know, groups, uh, manifolds, stuff like that, and also other things. Like, for example, we have a type of types. Um, this is paradoxical. This is in the, in the ordinary sense, but it's also solved by the same things you solve it in ordinary set theoretic mathematics. So I just want I'm going to brush that under the rug. And then we have elements of types, and we use this colon here. We say A is an A. Little a is an a to say that little a is an element. What type of element is it? It is a capital A. So for example, 3 colon n, so I'm going to write it up like this, says uh, 3 is a natural number. Right? And then we could have something you know, like pi is a real number. But we wouldn't have pi is a natural number. Um, and then we have variable elements. So x squared plus 1 is a real number given that x is a real number, right? And we write this expression like this as we have a bunch of, we in, in general could have a bunch of variables on the left-hand side. This is called the context. Um, then we have this symbol, which is called the turnstile. And then we have our element on the right. And so the ones on the left are all free variable declarations. They're, that's called our context. It's a list of the free variables and the type that they have. And the right is the actual element that we're writing down. And all type theory is, is a formal system for moving from certain statements of this type. If you have a bunch of free variables, then that thing is an element of this type, to other statements of that form. Okay. Uh, we can also have variable types. So here's an example. We have, uh, if m is a manifold and p is a point on m, then the tangent space of m at p is a vector space. In particular, it has an underlying type of vector. So it's a type of thing you can be. It's a tangent vector uh, at m. Uh, 2m at p. Um, so, are there any questions about this page? Yeah. How are the manifolds going? 
Uh, not harder than ordinary math, but that's not sig that's not super easy. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, yeah. Do this the same way. It depends on what you, where you start. Um, if you do synthetic differential geometry, it's actually quite easy. But if you do ordinary stuff, you it's not any faster. We're not going to do that at all. We're going to skip that whole thing because we're going to use pure homotopy theory. So we're not going to use manifolds at all. Okay. So. Uh, as I said, there are the rules in homotopy type theory are ways of moving from some statements of the form that uh, B of X is a capital B of X, given that X is an A, right, to others. So that's what, um, that's what that is. So we can form new types in particular. And so there's two important type formation uh, operations here. One is forming types of pairs. So if B of X is a type, whenever X is have type A, then we can form the type here of pairs of elements in A and an element in B of that element in A. So it's a pair AB, where A is in A, and B is in capital B of A, All right? And so uh, an example of this uh, uh, I give is the total space of a tangent bundle, where it, an element of that is a pair of a point on a manifold and a tangent a vector to that point. So the type of the second uh, element there depends on the first one, because it's a tangent vector to the the point that you're at, which is the first element of the pair. And similarly, we have function types. And here, uh, if B of X is a type for X of type A, then we have the type of functions which take an element of A, X of A, and give us an element B of X. And to define a function in type theory, you do it not as like some ordered pair or whatever that you would do in set theory. Instead, what you do is simply you assume you have a free variable of type A, and you write down an element F of X of type B of X and you get the function x maps to f of x. So that's just how it, how it works there. OK? So now um, I'm going to tell you the cubicle type theory approach to homotopy type theory. Homotopy type theory is more like a family of type theories. It's a, it's a vibe. So the, <laughs> the idea is that homotopy type theory takes really, at its basic, the notion of identification of mathematical objects. Um, Identification of mathematical objects, as it turns out, which, uh, for example, could be isomorphism of structures, could be equality of elements of sets, and it could be equivalence of categories. These are all notions of identification. Homotopy type theory takes the point of view that there's a single general notion of what we mean by identification, and it specializes to all these different ones in different cases. How this is implemented is different. Um, there is a, a homotopy type theory called book homotopy type theory, which was in the original textbook, where they implemented it using an using uh, Martinloff's identity type, which is actually uh, quite old. It's from the 70s, um, from like the original presentation of this type theory. Um, it turns out it has all this structure of homotopy theory sort of right away, which is actually kind of magical. And people didn't really realize it until the 90s and then on to the 2000s. Um, the problem with that is that to get it to really work, to get it to specialize, as I said, to all those different cases, like isomorphism of structures, equality of elements of sets, um, and equivalence of categories, yada, yada. Um, you need to add an axiom. And adding an axiom makes this thing not compute right because uh, everything we have, computing for type theory means reducing things to normal form. And if you have an axiom, um, that doesn't reduce to any normal form. It just doesn't have a normal form. So you can't compute. And that makes it so it's like, it doesn't work as a programming language anymore. So there's a much more complicated type theory that solves this problem. And it takes some real ideas from homotopy theory directly, which is that we're going to represent identifications as paths. And paths are going to be certain functions from an interval. So we're going to add this extra type called the interval. Um, I've, I've written here it's an, it's an exotype. Um, the cubicle type theorists would say it's a non-fibrant type. So the types that actual mathematics work with are called vibrant, and that means that they play well with the interval. The interval is, in fact, not itself vibrant. Um, so that doesn't really matter. It's an interval. It's like a type. It's a type, but you can't map into it from other types because it's meant to just be the indexes for our path. So it's not meant to be a data type. The, the elements of it aren't data. They're just generic elements meant to be the variables that you have when you're mapping into a path, when you're making a path. So, um, so we have this primitive interval object i, and we have its two endpoints, 0 and 1, i0 and i1. And a path is a function out of the interval, right, where we know that by definition, uh, it evaluates the first term, uh, uh, evaluates i0 to a, and evaluates i1 to b. So if it's a path from a to b, which we write with the three equals sign, um, 
then by definition, it computes the uh, I0. When you hit I0 with this function, you get A, and when you hit I1 with this function, you get B. And so um, the picture we are going to have is that you have a type here, and uh, you have the, the elements. Uh, it, it represents some kind of blob or space. It's elements or points. And then a path here, P, we would say P is of type A, path B. Right? Our paths are literally, we're thinking of them as paths. And here we literally think of the interval up there as a unit interval. So that's how we're thinking. Even though the interval doesn't actually have any other elements but 0 and 1. <laughs> um, any other closed elements. Um, so we also have a primitive called transport. And transport takes a path of types and turns it into a function. And so the idea is that a path of types you can think of as a continuous deformation of one type into another, which should be like a homotopy equivalence. In particular, you should be able to, as you deform the type into another, if you take any poor point and trace it out, it traces a path, and then that ends somewhere in the other type, and that's what transport does. So in particular, if we have a type here A, right? And then if we have over A, we have some type X of A uh, uh, gives us B of X as a type, right? Then we can form B uh, we can form here, this is the pairs of X of type A and an element of B of X. is a big type like this, because an element in here is a point of an element in A. Here, let's say this. Right, here is B of A, here is B of B. Right, so an element in here is a pair of an element down here and some point in the fiber over it. And that's how we think of these dependent types. Excuse me. Ugh. And, uh, uh, right. And so now, if I have an element up here, let's say I have x, right? well, the picture's over there, um, then I can, I can get a path in types. And where do I get my path in types? Well, this thing gives me a function b from a to type. And I have my function p from i to a. So I have b after a, after p, goes from i to type. I have a path of types. And what is that path? Well, you can think of this as the continuous, as you can see, this is a sort of a tube here. It's that continuous tube. And I can trace my x along this path here and get my, uh, get my substitution, my transport in b after p of x. OK? So that's how we end up with transport. And we'll think of this as our parallel transport for flat connections. The reason is that this transport is homotopy invariant. And uh, uh, here's where I'm going to slow down and talk about things a little bit more. So if I have a, a, another path here, right, and I have a, a path between them, so that's a homotopy, then I get another thing here, right? But the path between them actually induces a path between these two things, which also induces a path at the endpoints. So I get a path in the fiber. Now, now, I was supposed to get homotopy invariance. I was supposed to get equality. Right? But this is the point when we should ask, what is a path in some of our data types that we're familiar with, like integers and natural numbers and lists and things like that? And the answer is that a path of integers and reals and natural numbers and lists and all the ordinary programming junk um, are just equalities. You can only have a path which is constant. And you can prove that in the type theory. So you can compute out the constant that you are constant out of them. It's one of the endpoints, right? But yeah. Yes? What definition of R are you using for your, your discrete? Uh, because, I mean, there's R is oh, often continuous. Uh, yes. So how homotopy theory is a discrete theory. So R is, in fact, discrete in this world. It's the disjoint union of R many points. Yeah. So you could, you could interpret this theory in sheaves of homotopy types and then pick up a topology. Um, but uh, we're not doing that here. In fact, actually, totally discrete theory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we could use the modality, the cohesive modalities to do this. And if you add synthetic differential geometry, this is the TED 
K-theory is twisted equivariant differential K-theory. Equivariance and differential both correspond to certain kinds of cohesion, and you can do both of them together. This is work that Mitchell and I did uh, this year um, uh, at uh, CQTS. Um, and uh, um, you can put them both together, and then you can have in there uh, twisted means in a slice. So you can get the TED uh, cohomology theories living in this modal homotopy type theory. But we're not doing, we don't need any of that for this. This is actually just pure homotopy theory, so we actually just can do pure homotopy type theory. So yeah. Um, are there any other questions about that? Like, so what, I'm not, like the manifold stuff is like totally orthogonal to this, this kind of thing. I, I, I did think that it might be confusing, but I left it there because it's, the tangent space is a pretty good example of when you have like functions and pairs, I don't know. So. Okay, are there any questions about this? Yeah. So in your, your Agda program, were you working with inclusional sets or sequential sets? Like you're saying, not working with manifolds. Like what sort of... The Agda programs are... object is this space of parameters that you're... It's a type, a data type. It's just a data type. And if you wanted to talk about like a concrete one, like what would, how would you give such a thing? Um, so they, you can, um, I will talk about that. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, so how do you give data types in a purely functional language? Usually you can define them by induction, right? As an inductive data type or a generalized algebraic data type, a GAT, right? Um, and these things uh, are, are produce generally discrete things, um, right? If you, just, if you start with discrete stuff and you put it into a GAT, you get a discrete type out. In other words, the paths are constant in it, generally. However, because paths are just functions, you can just you know, put them in to a data type. So this is why I should have done a code review, but I'm not gonna, but I will write, this is uh, an example. So this is the actual code that generates the circle. So we will say the circle is a type where we have a point, which is generally called base, and we have a loop. And what is the loop? The loop is a path from base to base. And because this is, a, an, uh, this is an inductive type and it has a pattern matching property, which means I can write, my, I can write a function, say, um, I haven't told you how to define composition, but you'll have to believe me. I can write a function S1 to S1 called double, and I can write it using pattern matching. So double base would get base, and uh, double loop. Now loop is a function from the interval where we also have computation data witnessed on the endpoints. That's what makes it special. In other words, we know by, it's a function where we know by definition how it computes on certain values. This is the, the mojo of extension types in the, in the back end, but go on to it. So we have loop i uh, is equal to, so in other words, when I pattern match on this, this is secretly, this is like here, it's like a function i to s1. So if I, if i was just a fixed type and I did a data type where i to x1, when I pattern matched, I would get my pattern with an element of the domain bound, right? Like if I'm doing cons, I get like cons, x colon x's or x colon colon x's, right? Because uh, the, the data type there, the, the, my pattern is cons, right? And then uh, my, it's a function that takes in an a and a list of a and gives me a list of a. And so when I pattern match, I get an element of a and a list of a and then cons. It's just the exact same thing except that our, the, the thing in the domain is i. So we have a variable i, and now I need to send this somewhere. So I need some kind of new loop in there, but I but, uh, won't tell you how to do this, but I can actually define composites of loops, and then I could say compose the two loops, but then I actually need to give you an element of s1. I'm not giving you a path in s1, I'm giving you an element of s1. Well, I have a variable of the interval, so I, given a path, I can apply it to that, and I do. And this is actual code you can write down. And again, I didn't uh, prep a, uh, coding portion of this talk, but I probably should have, because like you can, you can really do all this stuff. Although I will say that I'm skipping over, like an, I think with this much time, I could probably do a little more, but I'm skipping over a lot because there's a ton of background that makes cubicle work. Basically, they, they, the way it works, it, com it computes um, because you add like a gazillion things that it can compute to. The main thing being uh, H-comps um, and glue types. I won't tell you about that, but H-comps basically 
to do it right, I would have to like spend a whole little time. I would have to talk to you about partial elements and stuff like this. There's uh, kind of a long run. Uh, this is maybe a good point to say that Mitchell Riley and I taught a uh, sort of an intro course to a bunch of undergrads at at uh, uh, NYUAD um, with the goal of getting them getting ready to do. Uh, to do research in this area, and in fact, they are working on a number of projects, including formalizing this, this stuff in this talk. Um, and so we're working on getting that out. But we wrote lecture notes, so if you're interested in this, the lecture notes will be put up. And if uh, since we are taking a little while to look over them and make them nice, I can share them with you right after if you ask me like, personally. So, um, okay. So transport is a primitive. There are a lot of other primitives that make this work, in, in, including the things called comp or homogeneous. Uh, 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 Heterogeneous compositions, which are called H comps, um, those give you allow you to to, to uh, compose loops, um, but I won't talk about that. Okay, so the point is we have this transport operation, which is primitive, and my claim is that that implements a sort of parallel transport with regards to a flat connection, and this is justified by this certain this external theorem, which is that if you have a manifold, um, then uh, then a flat connection is equivalent on a bundle is equivalent to um, a the homotopy invariance of parallel transport, right? So um, if I have a homotopy invariant parallel transport, I can write it. My claim is that I can write it that then that down as a type family. However, the there is no like algorithm that does that part. That's like up to us to do. And so I'll maybe talk about how we do that. So here's the main theorem. How much time do I have? One more, I was done. Oh, wow. I went through the same material in twice the time. I don't know how I did that. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, here's the main theorem. The point is we define this set over here. And this is the set of twisted cohomology things. I want you to, the thing I want you to note about, it's a lot of like syntax, but like what I want you to note is that it's a function and to a function, right? And then I didn't tell you what this is, but this is truncation. That's a certain inductive type that uh, kills the higher homotopy. Um, those are the uh, cohomology groups, the twisted cohomology groups. Um, so this might look complicated, but it's, uh, it's really, it's like everything fits on one slide. We go from zero to this in the paper, literally from the foundations of mathematics, full intro to homotopy type theory. We even define the reals uh, and the complex numbers in 40 pages, right? So if you tried to do that with the other side of the hypergeometric integral construction, the one with conformal period theory, it takes hundreds and hundreds of pages um, to do that. And the, and, um, and the cool thing is that if you want to actually uh, see what happens when you do parallel transport, you, in principle at least, can normalize. You can write down a path and then hit normalize, and it will normalize the parallel transport. It will actually just compute. It's a programming language. You can actually just compute with it, and it will just give you the result. Um, OK. So uh, I guess that's I guess uh, I guess I'm out of time. So I guess that's it. <laughs> so, Do you have any questions? I'm yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's the exact. I I uh, I thought I'd have more time to do more things, but I just gave it slower. I guess the exact same thing. Come on. Did you say so? You can reverse the interval or the mass interval. Itself? Yes. No, you can't do that. Um, uh, good question. So uh, what you can do is, thi uh, is this, is that if you have a path, if you have a shape like this, right? You have three paths. Um, and then usually they're actually oriented like this. Um, so this is an open box. You can close off the open box like this. Um, and this is sometimes, uh, this is, this is, uh, yeah, it's like a horn filling. Exactly. Although I won't, I will note that you only actually close off open bot. You only get the top thing that impl that actually, like the way they do it, it's very clever. Um, the way they do it implies they do it. So what you really do is what, I don't want to do much, but what you really do is if you have a point in here, say I, then what you can get is the point up here. Like it's all done in the in variable context. It's like really type theoretical, and so what the, it, it, it you can actually use the same technique that you do this to 
get the filler for the whole box. So you, it, you don't implement confilling, you just implement capping off the boxes. So the dimensions and then you give the boundaries on one half. Let's say this, you split your dimensions into two sort of chunks, and then you give the full boundary around one of those chunks and then only one side of the other. Right? Yeah, so yeah, what you do is um, you give, uh, you give uh, so um, what you really do is you, uh, you give, <laughs> It's like, it's, it's a little tricky to understand how this works, and it's, it's one thing that I, I uh, the lecture notes make a lot clear, but what you really do is you just give this point here, and over here you give a type, which maybe exists depending on some kind of uh, proposition about the point, and that proposition is expressed in the logic of the unit interval, which where the logic is max, min, and uh, negation is one minus. Um, so that's one minus is your reversal, but your extra structure is uh, max and min. And that is a De Morgan algebra. So it turns it into be a logic. And those formulas define subcubes. And in particular, the formula you give here says that i is i or one minus i. So uh, you'd say i and semi, i or semi. So this is gets translated into max i 1 minus i. And max i 1 minus i equals 1 if and only if i is 0 or 1. Right? So this sub-object corresponds to these endpoints. And as you can see, this cube, the top part, is only defined. The, the vertical, like, this is the j direction, this is the i direction. The j part only has an L, only is defined, it's a partially defined type. It's only defined when, uh, when i is 0 or 1 here. And so then you can complete it up in the element. So that's how you end up doing it. It's a little, it's, 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 it's tough to get. Um, uh, uh, I think it's something that you, you play around with. Once you get it, it's actually really fun to work with, though. Um, and then so what is the actual composite there? You usually take this to be the identity function. So you take this to be like just if this is, you know, call it REFL. The identity, the, the constant function, I should say, and then this top one becomes uh, q dot r up here. So yeah, it's so kind of a weird. In fact, you often find that uh, in, that actually mathematics uses the paradigm where you have all three more often than you think. Um, yeah. Put q and r and then refl on the right and contract it on the right. That would give you a different definition of q dot r. Yeah. So well, if I did, which one? If you had q on the left. Yeah, all three of them work. This one's a little weird because if you see, they're in the same direction. So oh, that, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so this is this is uh, oh, we call it yeah we, it's, we you know q inverse dot r. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And and you know and then what's cool is how do you show that these are equal? Well, you build cubes that fill into them and so on. Yeah, it's fun. It's actually uh, uh, yeah. And what's really cool is there are some tools in this. Like if you go to a talk where people do this to do synthetic homotopy theory, you get to see the really cool stuff, which is there's these, some tools that will automatically visualize the cubes for you. So you can actually see the code gets turned into like syzygy, like actual homotopies uh, witnessing these kind of like solipsis and stuff. I saw a talk on that, yeah. Uh, can, you, can I ask you a question? I was gonna ask you something. Um, is it? No, so I, I just happened to, this is the simplest version you can draw, but the cubicle ones work as well, where you have a, you have a, then but still, cubicle, yeah, is the, is, like, is the cubicle thing the uh, analogy of equipment for uh, triple You can do any kind of weird shape like this, and you can fill as well. It's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> do you do it in an iterative way, where you sort of fill the boundaries first, and then? Uh, yes, um, and that's actually forced on you by substitution, because uh, to solve the whole problem, it has to also be that if you substitute in, for a vari for variable equaling i zero or something, if you substitute in one of the dimensions equaling i zero, that's restricting to a face. So when you substitute in, you have to be solving the same resulting problem. So it's forced that you have to do it iteratively to to be uh, stable under substitution, which is really cool. There's a lot of really cool type theory under underlying the cubicle stuff that makes it work. Um, I, I don't know if it has to do with equipment very much. Um, it's kind of like I mean, it's 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 uh, it's in a way the the, the 
the fundamental infinity group void represented as a uh, like you know cubical structure, or cubical type. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's a theory of infinity double categories, but I know that there's a theory of infinity double categories, but it's, I only know the multi-simplicial version of it. I don't know a cubical one. I, I think there is a cubical. Well, no, no, they do multi-simplicial. So I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the other, so the actual, like, like, these things actually, like, maybe one thing I, I could say I didn't say, but, like, how do you actually... One of the things you actually need to do is to find all these types. And, and one thing I wanted to talk about was the configuration spaces. So one thing I wanted to note is, like, let's say you have a braid like this. Pretty cool, this picture, okay? So here's another thing you can do. Let's say we start with little loop, we start with a base point and we draw little loops over. So we have our three little loops, one around each hole, okay? The thing I want you to note is that the space here is homotopy equivalent to the space of just the union of these loops because I can squidge in here, squidge in here, and then schmoop everything down. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so this is a homotopy equivalent picture, but now when I do my braid and I just like drag this out, imagining that I'm like, you know, this is why I had a taffy pulling on the uh, first page. Because if you think about what, the way I like to think about topological quantum computing is that you make field taffy. You like move around your defects and the fields like, like do this. And then that's why you end up with braided histories because you see all the layers here come, they, they record every single twist that this machine has made. It's really kind of cool when you think about it. Um, the mathematics is literally the same. <laughs> so what's cool is that we, uh, we, okay, so every braid we do ends up braiding together these lines. Let me give a little more careful thing here. So we get a braiding of these lines and we, we get uh, a equivalence of the uh, wedge of three circles, which we can define as an inductive type in, in this way. The wedge of three circles here would have a base point and then three loops um, on the base point, right? Um, or the way I wrote it here, it would be three circles and another point, and then three pads between it. Depends on how you want to implement it, right? It's like a, that's, the, that's the one that comes out if you use the more general operation that takes n circles, right? If you, yeah. Anyway, sorry. You go over. So here, these things here represent new pads, but you can express them in terms of these pads, right? I'll just say how. The, the, the red one, for example, as you can see, it goes up the green one, goes up here, goes around back here, then goes back down, then goes back up to the red, then goes around. So it can be expressed as a conjugate almost. It's a half conjugate, the green ones. So which automorphisms correspond to braids? Every, auto, every braid I'm sort of telling you here corresponds to one of these automorphisms by doing it, right? But which ones correspond to braids? It turns out that they're the ones that preserve exactly this data. They preserve the black boundary, which I didn't even tell you about, but it was sort of secretly there. And what is the black boundary? It is the composite of each one of these loops. Do you see, homotopically it's the composite of all these. And it preserves each of the generators, but unpointed. Because it did not, what is their, what is their pointing? The pointing of the generating loop is the wire. And precisely what we did is we taffied up the wire so they didn't preserve. And you can show that, uh, that an automorphism of the wedge of n circles that preserves the generating circles and the boundary is precisely a braid. So the, these, the automorphism group of this st structure, this data structure that preserves this, which is to say a type equipped with lots of maps from circles effectively, um, uh, is equivalent to uh, the braid group, um, the pure braid group. Probably so up and the, and the right. Visual seminar. People are welcome to hang out and continue. Yeah. To sorry about that. Yeah. Any questions? But uh, let's thank the speaker one more time. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> so.